Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June 20th uh, meeting of the Villanova CICD Care Group. Um, we're glad to be back at Radnor Township to be able to stream this from you live and also on YouTube for later viewing. Um, the first item of, of, that we have in front of us is the adoption of our agenda, so I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Second? Seconded? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, agenda is adopted. The next is the approval of minutes, which you have seen before. So I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the, the minutes. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. Then it passes uh, one, two, six to zero. Next items up are the chair report, which I have done, I think, except to say that um, I want to be able to make sure that we have time at towards the end of the meeting, enough time that we want to discuss the two reports that we have in front of us. So I'll ask that we do our review and communication portion as efficiently as possible so that we can make sure that we allow enough time at the end for the other items on the, on the discussions. So the first item is the West, West Lancaster Avenue lot. Just a final follow-up on the lighting actions. And um, with that, I'll say that I've checked them and I've looked at them and I think that the new frosted glasses are, look, look fantastic. Yeah, I think it's a night and day difference between the two. So, uh, Mary Lou, do you have any comment on installing them? And that you put the shields on all of those, uh, on most of those pieces that you said that you were going to do, and you put the frosted glass on them. And uh, and then there was also a a 75 foot, uh, six foot high fence that was placed uh, at St. Thomas Way and moving westward. It was actually more than 75 feet. All right, how, how significantly more? It was 150 feet, but don't tell Chris. <laughs> okay, all right. Then we didn't tell Chris. Uh, what, what, what caused it to be double the length? Was that your call? It just is. <laughs> okay, well, great. Well, I'm sure the neighbors will appreciate that, and, um, and that, that part is great. I can also make mention of the fact that um, last Thursday at the Zoning Hearing Board, uh, they he heard an appeal uh, for a variance for uh, six uh, Alwyn la uh, Lane uh, neighbors who back up against the R100 line and face the uh, West lot, uh, West Lancaster lot. And those folks had chosen to be part of a, of a variance request and th that variance request was uh, granted for an extra two feet of fencing to allow eight foot fencing, which allows them to block uh, uh, what they see of the parking lot lights at night and also anything that they see of the uh, construction during the daytime. So I think they were very pleased with it and it was, I'm glad that the township was able to uh, make that uh, make that possible for them. Um, I do have one question on the lighting. I did notice when I just took a quick check of it that there were two lights at the very <coughs> western end along the uh, rail line, along that backside there that did not have the frosted glass. And I wondered if they were scheduled to get it, or just that was somehow those were uh, determined not to be needing the uh, the frosted glass. Uh, it may be that they were determined not to need them. Okay. They were not in our sketch. Okay. Commissioner, uh, yes. I may. So there were, I don't recall the exact number, but not every, it, in the review with our consultants, not every light required that. So, but Villanova did agree we actually had a, a marked up plan of what was to be changed out and what was to get the two inch black guard, what was to get frosted glass, and they have complied with that. Okay, great. And just to set the record straight, they weren't required, we did that. Thank you for setting that straight, and that is that is great. They were not required, but the Villanova had chosen to do that. Steve, I might ask at a time that, that just just confirm that the, somehow that those two did not need it, just so we can put that all to bed. Yes, actually, we uh, brought the solicitor in on this, and we had uh, two consultants. Our original reviewer was Gannett Fleming, who was uh, who uh, is appointed by the township to do those reviews, and we also brought uh, a firm in outside to look at the lighting, and. When uh, the solicitor was there as the, uh, as the wise Solomon that he is, he, it was determined that they were not required to do so. Uh, that was agreed upon and you know, through his uh, research and evaluation of it, Villanova did agree to do it, even though it was not required. They did agree to do it for the, uh, the community. Thank you for that explanation and clarification. Uh, uh, yes. If I could just go on the record and, and uh, express many thanks to Villanova for the installation of the frosted panes in the majority of the 
the lot fixtures, and this represents a vast improvement for residents whose view includes these lights and for pedestrians who must pass beneath them without any way diminishing the safety of the area. I do hope that this is going to be the norm throughout the CICD once, those, once that project is complete. So if you recall, Rick, we went in front of the zoning board and asked for a variance so that we could do just that. Distinctly. And we got denied. We have to put in 100% dark sky fixtures, not 96.5, uh, 100%, and the faucet does not give you dark sky compliance. My understanding was that you had found, however, going back to the market, you had found Gothic style. With glass. With glass. Mm -hmm. That's a shame, because the frosted actually does represent uh, a much more pleasant pedestrian experience, and that's going to be critical for uh, the area in and around the dorms themselves. As it is, the unmodified fixtures that remain are chiefly uh, the two that you mentioned, but there's also um, a gang along St. Thomas Way and wrapping around the front of Moriarty. Are those to be changed out once? once Torcon's lay down is all done in the visitor's lot? Uh, I believe we did put them in the visitor's lot. Um, and wherever it showed on the, the drawings that we agreed upon is where those frosted lenses are going. Okay. The, the ones on Lanc adjacent to Lancaster Avenue was not required. Exactly. Because they were at Lancaster Avenue and okay. not that. I think both, I'm chiefly concerned about the ones aligning both sides of St. Thomas Way between the uh, between the railroad and Lancaster. That's, that's very, very garish in there. But if you have a plan, you have a plan. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for reporting on that and thank you for getting that in there. I think it's a market improvement to having the frosted glass on there, as well as the, uh, the two inch shielding at the top to take care of the glare of the lights. Uh, next we turn to an overview of the recent construction activity. And I'll turn to Steve and just ask him to talk about any issues, problems, or if there are none, to, to at least advise us of that since our last meeting. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, at this time, so this is a very different project than the previous one, which was more of a, uh, which was, was totally a site project, a civil project. It was parking lot, retaining walls, and such. This really is, uh, at this stage, is totally a building construction project, you know, which is handled by the code enforcement officials in our community development department. I can tell you from a site standpoint, we do have the site inspected, uh, and they're basically there for the ENS control at this point. I've had n no complaints, uh, no problems. I think Villanova took, uh, took what we noted and did in the first phase to heart and uh, truly uh, made their contract and their contractor have to adhere more. I talked to the owner of the company or the contractor. I see him on site. He constantly comes up to me and says, is everything okay? Uh, we're not getting mud on the streets. We're not, you know, so uh, in that respect, from the site standpoint, it's, uh, it's been very good. Great, thank you. Mary Lou, anything you want to add to it? Um, is, there, is there another, would this be under the, uh, oh, this is the review. Um, no, what Steve said is pretty accurate. I mean, we're really, uh, going through the site and wetting it down once or twice a day, sometimes three times a day. We've been fortunate enough to get um, rain early in the morning and in the afternoon sometimes, which does a real good job of controlling dust. And uh, we're not using the street sweeper as much, which I think was drumming up a lot of the problems with the dust. So um, from that standpoint, yeah, we're moving along. Sounds great, thank you. Is there any other comment from anyone? Um, if uh, this is probably for Mr. Norsini, but um, uh, the construction along North Ithan, which appears to be sewer pipe, is that for the dorms? Uh, so, Mr. Leonardi, this was all part of the uh, the sewage facilities planning module that Villanova submitted, which uh, rerouted some flows to Lower Marion, right. more flows to Lower Marion less flows to Radnor Township, so we, we had a reduction in flows. That's what that is. And when, when the sanitary sewer pipe is being built that is in Radnor Township and the flows are coming to Radnor Township, we'll be inspecting that on a day, an all-day basis. I, I note that it appears as though the sewer line that is going to join the Lower Marion service um, 
is coming along, appears to be coming along North Ithan, under North Ithan, obviously, underneath the Bartley garage and is passing underneath the R5 through an existing culvert. Is that correct? Yes, it's going through a pipe, though, under the well, culvert. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's actually coming from Doherty Drive, which you haven't seen the excavation for that. Yeah. It's running down uh, North Ithan Avenue. Uh, it stops at Bartley, and then it's picked up at the main entrance to our campus. There's a manhole there that we will put a new doghouse there and connect to that. And I think we've already run the, the pipe from that point down the sidewalk and into HSB Garage. And from HSB Garage, we go under the railroad tracks in a, uh, uh, an existing pipe that's there. Yeah. And then we've already... I don't know if we've made the, we haven't made the connection to Lower Murray yet, but we're pretty close to it. Right. Well, I, you know, I recognize the efficiency of that solution. Um, you're satisfied, of course, that there's little danger of leakage or anything of that sort from the sewer pipe into an existing water flow, which is what that culver represents after all. That's okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can I add right here, just real yeah. quick, since it's West Parking Lot? I was uh, for I was up at the campus for Father Joe's goodbye, and um, I ha took some pictures, which is this packet that I gave you all. Um, I assume that those are going to be replaced, or or the some that are trees in the buffer that are dying, not very happy, kind of looking ill. Um, I assume those are going to be either replaced or somehow taken care of. The ones that are in the buffer, we will maintain. There's a couple that you've shown pictures that are right in front of dormitories that we actually added there for privacy, and they've died, and yes, we're going to replace those. Oh, sorry, I didn't turn that on. Yes, that's what I was assuming. That's why I just want to point it out, get it on the record. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay, good. Thank you for those explanations. Uh, next up is um, items about Oops. communication. Usually we hear from Villanova at this point, uh, just an update on the phases and the projects for the residence halls and the pedestrian bridge. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mary Lou to, to see what she wants to let us know. So I guess phases of the project, uh, the pedestrian bridge and the housing are going on simultaneously. Um, we are on, uh, starting from the west end with the bridge, we have crossed the street and are doing the second abutment, or actually it's abutment number one, but it's on the south side of Lancaster Avenue. Uh, you can see that they're forming that, and uh, that takes pretty much every bit of two weeks to three weeks to finish that whole process. And uh, we've poured a few other piers, so th they're moving forward. Again, we have two contractors working, two different contractors working on this project. Um, there'll be more work being done on the north side starting next week, which is close to the church. We'll be coordinating closely with uh, the parish and our campus um, with building the bigger plaza outside the base of the church and running, you know, regrading that side of the street. Um, still scheduled to complete that by the middle to end of December. Um, housing, uh, we are pretty much uh, out of the ground for three of the, f or, uh, three of the four basements that we have, and um, you see walls going up on the first floor, and we have plank being delivered. Originally, we were going to have plank being delivered off of Lancaster Avenue. Um, the trucks are too big, so we actually are having them come in through St. Thomas Way, and we're craning them from there. So hopefully you're not seeing any issues with traffic because they're all on our property. Um, so it's a block and plank job now as we, you know, you build the floor of block, you put the plank on top, and then you do the next floor. And as soon as we get into the groove of that, we'll be moving quite quickly. So that's the status of where we are right now for housing construction. Brandon, what, uh, what, when would you anticipate this point, uh, the completion of that portion of it? Not the finishing of it, but the actual building of the uh, of the dorms the outsides the uh, the structure itself we hope to be enclosed by winter hmm. we'll st i mean shortly you're going to start seeing stone go up as well nice. so they'll everyone just keeps following along 
you know, from west to east. So um, if everything works out and we get all, you know, everything is delivered on time and is, you know, we don't have too many rain outs, then we will uh, be enclosed by probably Christmas time. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Is there any discussion or questions uh, regarding uh, these items? No? Okay. Very good. Uh, before we move on to the next section of the discussion of the, uh, the two uh, 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 reports, is there anything from the public that they want to talk about on uh, review or communication of those items? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. And that is on uh, the idea of planning. We wanted to have some discussion of the, of the Radnor Township testing that was done by Ratu. And uh, there were really two items here. The, the major one, of course, was the main lot asphalt and the soil report by Ratu and then the Valley Run report uh, by Ritu. So at this point, I think I'd like to ask uh, Steve Dick Gabriel to come on up and give us a, an overview and some conclusions that they were drawn. The uh, report itself has been on the website. I know you guys have read it, we've read it, and perhaps a member of the public as well. So Steve, welcome. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. Chris, good to see you again. Um, I've seen everybody else this evening. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us down, and I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. Um, but um, uh, there are, yeah, we have two reports here, one dealing with the uh, soils and asphalt sampling, so I'll, and how about I start with that first. Um, we, we were looking at, particularly with the asphalt, whether asbestos was present, and then, and then the general quality of the soils uh, all throughout the site. Um, we established eight soil boring locations um, and pushed through the asphalt and as much as 15 feet below the surface into the soil. Um, found two layers of asphalt, so there were samples taken of, of both layers, so a total of 16 samples of, of asphalt um, sent off to a lab, and then uh, um, there were two samples of each soil coring, uh, one at a, at a very um, minimal depth, one to two feet, zero to two feet. Uh, the other one much deeper, um, as I said, up to, up to 15 feet deep, perhaps in that 13 to 15 foot range for, for most of them. Um, let's see. In terms of findings, um, no asbestos was found in the asphalt. And everybody has a copy of, of our report, so you've, you've seen the, the, the boring locations throughout the site, and I probably should point out those locations were a combination of at least a couple of factors. One, Mary Lou getting us onto the site and finding, helping to find spots where construction activity wasn't going on or wasn't hot and heavy at the time uh, in April. Um, and not in places where excavation was either planned or already having taken place for the buildings themselves. Uh, we were sampling and tried to find locations where the soils were gonna be staying on site. Um, soils for the excavation of the, of the basements and the buildings perhaps were, were gonna be leaving the site. Our eight sites primarily looked at soils that were gonna be staying on the site so that there would be at least a little bit of consideration given to uh, human contact with the soils, um, and as well as any groundwater influences that uh, the sampling would, would show. Um, I believe Mary Lou had pointed out that across the site there was a couple of feet of clean fill soil being brought in for the whole site. Actually, um, most of the areas that have not been excavated to date uh, have been kept that way to minimize dust and dirt and being able to actually build this with machines driving around all the time. So we've left the blacktop there. Or, um, and ultimately that, we will probably excavate another two to three feet out of that site and take that away uh, to where the final grade is. Um, it, meaning two to f three feet away plus probably even more than that because we'll be bringing back uh, in areas that will be landscaped areas, there's uh, I think eight to 10 inches of topsoil that comes in and different 
uh, you know, whether it's, uh, for example, in front of the, 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 floor, the eastern building, uh, in that courtyard, we actually excavate down even further than that because the, the landscaped area will actually be also a bed of stone so that if there's a fire or something like that, that a fire truck can actually come in there and not sink. So there's a lot more excavation to be done. It just hasn't been done to date mm -hmm. because we're trying to keep it stable for the construction of the buildings. Right, right. Very good. Um, so the um, asphalt did not show any asbestos, uh, which was, was a good finding. Um, in terms of the soil samples, we, we, we took those samples, as I said, a total of 16, compared the readings that were found through the, the lab analysis with um, the state's statewide health standard medium specific concentrations. Um, the term medium is related to the term media, uh, and it's essentially just referring to the material that you might find any of these uh, items in, uh, so in the soil in the asphalt in these, in these cases. Uh, there's not a high and a low around the medium. We're talking about uh, material uh, when we refer to the term medium. Um, no volatile organic compounds were found. No BCP PCBs were found in any of the collected soil samples. Um, the VOCs did not um, exceed any of the um, applicable residential standard uh, concentrations of the state. Um, I think as you, as you read through the, the report, there were a few places where there were some exceedances of these standards, and uh, if you'll bear with me, let me go through those a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, one semi-volatile organic compound, benzoapyrene, uh, was detected above its residential direct contact uh, standard. 0.58 milligrams per kilogram in two samples um, at the R2 sampling location at depth, somewhere between 13 and 15 feet, um, at a concentration of 1.19 milligram per kilogram. So it's about double the standard for the residential um, direct contact standard. That did, that did not, however, exceed all the other standards for non, so-called non-residential residential direct contact um, or the soil to groundwater standard. So um, you'll hear that in these other cases too, and, and our guys have said that's an indication of a, of a, a, a very minor condition and situation, and it's certainly not a clean bill of health but it's not something that is exceeding all the standards and exceeding it wildly. And there's a big difference in, in those cases. Uh, and they were, they were glad to see these results. If we're gonna have exceedances, the minimal amounts, the minimum exceedances, um, overall was, was a, good, a good result and a good finding. Um, let me talk about that one, the R2 sampling site at a depth of 13 to 15 feet. Um, the sampling result at that same site, R-2, in the one to two foot range was below the standard. So it met the standards. Um, there was another sampling site, R-3, very close by, relatively speaking, to the R-2. Um, the benzopyrene was not detected at all at either shallow or at depth at R-3. So it's an indication it's a fairly isolated circumstance. Uh, at least in terms of our samples, the closest one showed nothing. Um, the one shallow showed very little. It was only the one at depth that exceeded a standard. Uh, and certainly, comparison with perhaps some of the other sampling that Villanova had done early on could confirm that this is rather isolated. Further, benzoapyrene um, was also found at, a at the shallow depth at the R6 sampling location uh, at a concentration of 2.66 milligrams per kilogram. Um, this was, did exceed the direct contact um, 
for residential for residential purposes. By how much? Excuse me? Oh, by how much? Uh, the standard is 0.58 milligrams, so it's about four times. Thank you. Um, at the same time, at depth, benzo A pyrene was not detected at all. So we're not seeing it traveling through the soil uh, column. It, based on our samples, it has not traveled down and located at depth. It was just a, a situation in, in the shallow areas. And like I said, the close by R-3, no detection either at shallow or at depth. Um, so soil to groundwater was not exceeded. That's protective of groundwater conditions um, in the soil. Two other items to talk about in, in the soils. Lead was detected above a residential and non-residential soil to groundwater uh, standard in the sample R-8 uh, at a shallow level. The concentration was 972 milligrams per kilogram. The standard there is 500 milligrams for, per kilogram, so it's about double. Uh, at depth, it was, again, way below the standard. So we're not seeing it traveling, um, and it is, it is just the, the one location. And then beryllium was detected at the sampling location R-7. At depth, 13 to 15 feet, 2.3 milligrams per kilogram, the standard is two. Um, in, some, in some quarters, you would even round that 2.3 down to two. Um, as our report indicates, there's a very slight exceedance at that point. Um, there, it did not exceed its residential soil to groundwater, so groundwater was, was well protected. Direct contact non-residential was also not exceeded in that location. Another factor to keep in mind when we, when we look at these is what's the proposed land use um, that's, that's in the plan, in the development plan, uh, at these locations. Um, we've, we've talked about there's going to be some further excavation, so some of these um, exceedances at one to two feet depth very well may be excavated um, in the process of further development of the site. But at the same time, when you look at those four locations, and when I went through, we looked at, we were talking about R-2, R-6, dash seven, and dash eight. Um, if, if you go, if you look at each of those locations and, and, and approximate, and I think Mary Lou may have some GPS coordinates for these sampling locations, and if you're able to make any kind of verification with what's going on on your site, We have a drawing you can look at that overlays the buildings and all the sampling we did along with the sampling you did. Uh, we also, just so everyone knows, took split samples of these. So what Ritu took, we, at, we took as well and sent to a different lab. And uh, we received similar results in, I believe, uh, two, six, and eight. However, seven with the beryllium, we got nothing. So even in, his, in uh, Steve's report, so loud, even in Steve's report, uh, they kind of discount the beryllium as maybe this isn't something. And our sample, which we took a split, exact same thing, we got nothing. So. Yeah, and what I wanted to say is that in, the, in those locations, uh, at R-2, it appears to be at the very edge of a building. Oh. Um, at R-6, it's potentially covered. The location is potentially covered by a walkway, a uh, concrete walkway. So I can add to that. I'm sorry, I, I thought you might take this, but I can add to that. So the, the R-2, which is right outside the building, and it's at a depth of, I think, 13 to 15 feet? Yes. We're not doing any excavation there other than 
uh, it being sidewalks and landscaping. Uh, as for the R6, you're correct. That will be uh, like a plaza area outside of the, the main entrance there. So that will also be covered. And the R8 specifically is the new roadway. So yes. whatever we have to excavate down for the final access drive, you know, um, that will be removed as well as covered up with uh, materials for a roadway. And the R7 we're not that concerned about because it's actually also right next to a building. Even if there was something there, there's, you know, it's going to be buried. It, and it's in a it's in a spot that nobody is really going to. It's behind a building, between a, a, a sitting or screen wall. It's just not a spot that there's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic. And so, here. just to ask a question about the standards that you are comparing this to, it's my understanding that these numbers are based on ingestion, like eating it, not inhalation, or even touching it. It's more of a, uh, an eating. And I don't know if you're aware of that or not. I, I haven't heard anybody refer to it that way. Um, yeah, I actually have a. I'll be glad to try and verify with our guys I mean, whether that's ingestion or whether it's just direct contact. As the, as the when words. you finish, I think that possibly uh, we have uh, Paul Morano here from uh, Advanced Geo Services who did our report and um, has a lot of knowledge on uh, environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So he might be able to kind of put this in context for us. Good. Good. Uh, Steve, with respect, um, I think I, I appreciate your effort here in identifying the the eight sites and uh, where they fall in relation to the buildings and so forth. But what you seem to be describing is a condition of hot spots, um, a, a kind of fruitcake of results. Um, you can you can certainly guarantee that these eight spots are benign on any kind of uh, to to you know in any kind of future condition. But um, unless you're willing to drill what every every two feet throughout the site this kind of approach is not all that reassuring um, I think I think the best thing we said here is that yeah you, you drilled in eight places and you got some results you drill in eight other places who knows what sort of results you're going to get um, there really isn't all that much assurance in terms of the site in total from what you're saying here I, mean, I understand. I understand that there are limits to your approach, but uh, I wouldn't push this line of argumentation very hard. The the standards for an Act Two DEP environmental clearance would require more sampling um, of the site. Um, but I think what the township tried to do was supplement the sampling that Villanova had performed with some additional <coughs> sampling at different locations around the site. So we have we have a total of 16 locations now that cover a variety of places, um, you know, across the site. It, it is, you know, when, I think when you, you look back at, at table, I want to say table one, um, yep, uh, when you look at table one, um, and 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 look at the what page is that on, Steve? It's I want to say about page 18, page 17, page 18 of the this report. Like that chart. Yeah, this one. Yeah. 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 That encapsulates the all the different. Um, metals, SVOCs, and VOCs that were, were tested for, analyzed for, um, over the eight different sampling locations, the two different depths at each location. Um, it calls out four, four aspects where there were exceedances. So on an overall basis, that's a pretty good, con a pretty good finding. Um, and, and that's why I went back and at least took a look at, in the R2 case, um, where we had some of the benzoapyrene to take a look at um, the sampling location nearest, uh, nearest to that one to see what else was going on, and also to look at depth um, 
you know, our, um, that to see whether there's any traveling of those of those items. Well, uh, can I? Would it be safe to say that if you were to if you were to proceed with further testing, you would do you would uh, try and achieve a more homogeneous test pattern, a more homogeneous sampling pattern across the entire site. For example, I was I don't know whether you've seen this. It's a handout extrapolating the. Uh, the upstream extent of Valley Run, connecting the dots between the culvert where it comes to light and outlet A where it, the flow was last seen below ground. Um, you'll notice the sampling that you've done r largely omits the, the, that extrapolated upstream extent. I would be more assured, frankly, if you did testing along that line just to make sure that none of the stuff is mobilizable into the watershed. We did testing down along Valley Run. So Yes, but this, that area, as Mary Lou just said, has not been excavated yet. Where I, th I think it's going to be, it's going to be very important to, to establish a baseline of what contaminants exist directly upstream of Valley Run so that you can know it and recognize it when you see it downstream. Mary Lou's seen this? Well, then why don't we, Mary Lou, I mean, as far as the extrapolated line, what's going on on the site? What kind, kind of construction? Buildings, walkways, combination of both? So is this the continuation of Valley Run that we think that the Army Corps of Engineers said isn't there and that other people have said, I, I don't know, Rick? This is the same, this is actually the same question that comes up at every single meeting. And if I understood it, I'd be able to answer it properly. But we have done investigation after investigation to see if this is actually the headwaters. And we've been told it isn't. No, a flow pattern has been established between the north side culvert, which is now lost thanks to the excavations, and the south side coming to daylight. Okay. Flow has been established at the rate of 10 feet per hour. Um, the water does travel underneath the R5 line. I mean, you can argue that it begins in, in the ditch between the southern border of Main Lot and the embankment, but I don't think that's plausible. Well, Steve, you did, you did research into this area, which after the Army Corps of Engineers had already determined that there was nothing that the federal government had an interest in regulated right. in right. waterways right. up in there. So what was your determination? Is this line uh, plausible or, I mean, what, uh, what was your determination as far as Our determination the beginning, of, this, the beginning was, of this stream? There was no apparent evidence of a stream existing on the parking lot area prior to the parking lot being there, uh, I mean, based on the 1940 right. photograph. Um, certainly, um, the existence of land use and vegetation on the Aldwin Triangle confirmed that, you know, uh, flowing water across the triangle was, was in existence prior to the main parking lot being constructed and continues to be. Um, so we didn't, we didn't find any evidence of headwaters uh, or valley run running through the parking lot area. Um, Again, with respect, from reading from your own report, Ratu assumes there was a culvert underneath the railroad in 1942, more or less, where a culvert ex exists present day. And if a culvert was present in 1942, then there was obviously a reason for it, that being a means of transporting water from the north side of the railroad bed to the south side of the railroad bed. Right. And we go on to say that that water is in all likelihood storm water because we don't see a stream bed uh, existing in the parking lot, but that certainly everything flows that direction. The campus, Route 30, and main parking lot, it all heads that, heads that way, heads south. But there is water communicating from main lot into Valley Run. However you characterize that water, there is water reaching Valley Run from the north side. And I don't think, I don't think we would argue with that. It's just not a, not a it's, it's just not a stream and it's not and we, we found, based on not only the sampling, but the characteristics and the macroinvertebrates, that it's an intermittent stream from the rail line down to Brooklay Road, um, and then becomes um, 
permanent at that point. Steve, uh, let me bring you in for this for a moment and turn about the, uh, the pattern of where they place their, uh, their borings and their, and their samplings. Uh, is this consistent with what the Board of Commissioners had asked them to do and with what you might have expected uh, their, their plan? I think you had seen it beforehand. Yes, I, I did, Commissioner, and I, I think it's consistent with uh, what Retu was able to access, you know, understanding the construction was in full swing. Uh, and they couldn't necessarily, you know, have a crane lower a drill rig into a basement or something. They uh, were able to test where they could. And yes, I mean, I think everybody sees that, if you want to call it a gap. But uh, I think Red 2 did what they could at that stage of the game when there was full swing construction. If the lot was empty and we went in, you know, I, I, my guess is, my assumption is that there may be a different bore pattern. but. Uh, they, they, and they actually had to work long and hard with the university on you know, looking at plans, looking at what's being constructed as to where they could go. So in a perfect world, would that, would that uh, bore pattern be different? I, I believe it would. Uh, understanding the constraints of sizable construction going on in a, in a very tight area, I, you know, my thought is Steve did the best he could as far as where he placed them. And, and if there's construction there, does that mean that, that, that there was excavation there and that the soil is gone? But not only that, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's inaccessible. So if you, uh, if you looked, I mean, it's actually, there are sizable basements. They are very deep. They are very wide. There's overdig. So when, when, you, when you dig for a structure, uh, a wall, there has to be room left for the formwork and for the workers to form it up, to pour it. So there's sizable excavations, and there's no uh, normal way that a, that a drill rig would get down into that to do that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. Nope. No, I would not. I just have a question. Um, I guess my concern is that, yes, you've dug down, and now you've disturbed stuff that's been sitting there for years and years and years, and it's either been hauled away or it's now exposed to the air. Um, I went through every all the analytical results, and here, there, and everywhere, there was lead in, in the ground, even at 10 or 13 feet down, but you're digging a basement that's probably 10 to 15 feet down. And is, is the water table close enough that it could, because it's now been disturbed, be now become part a, a problem for, the, for any water or any runoff that, that is there? I mean, that would occur when it rains, watering the lawn, whatever. And that's, that's, I mean, I went through every, there's, you know, I mean, there's lead, there's, um, there's even arsenic, which I thought was very interesting. There's um, copper. I mean, obviously, a lot of these are natural substances that are just in the dirt. But I was just, arsenic was a little surprising. But um, there were results for, I mean, on every single solitary sample, except for somewhere near number eight, I guess, was, there wasn't as much. I just it was or layers acetone things like that that showed up in there with a number rather than none detected. I was looking through all the analytics so, or the so I just that's a question. Once it's been disturbed, what happens? Kind of deal. And Jane, when you when you talk about disturbed, you're talking like about dug up by and exposed by, to the air by construction activity. Not, yes, not the soil borings themselves. Right. Okay. Now that you've got basements. You've got ground that has not been touched since well before, what, 1958 or whatever that, the one we had in our packet. I'm just curious, is there, is there water nearby that it could get leach into, that it could get into people's lungs, children's lungs, workers' lungs, those kind of things? That's my question. Um, I don't have an answer to your question. Okay. Um, I mean, as far as, as, far as the groundwater goes, um, these, the standards are set and in almost every case were met um, right. for protecting groundwater. Um, at, at the same time, uh, as far as airborne materials, um, you know, the asbestos was, I think, the primary concern of the township as far as airborne material, and we didn't find any in the asphalt. Right. Well, um, I, was, I didn't expect to find lead, but I mean, I guess I did, but I mean, they, I mean, you got the PSAs all over tel of television and radio saying even the smallest model lead is dangerous to children, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just, it was, I was surprised to see it there. I mean, that there was some. 
you know, I, were you surprised? <laughs> and I, and our, our guys have, have said that um, um, as if you, given our practices mm -hmm. uh, in construction, in, in painting buildings, the interiors, the exterior of buildings, there's, there's lead in a lot of places. Right. Um, especially with any, any buildings, you know, of a certain age. Um, so we're all, I think we all live with it. Um, and these are the conditions that we have from all of our use of Route 30, uh, of the Villanova campus, and anywhere nearby. Um, so that's what I think we've got now in front of us is, is, is sampling that, that's, you know, it's not a non-detected situation, but based on our recognition of those, ex the existence of those materials, um, you know, the best people that we have in our, in our governmental levels have established standards that um, are, are meant okay. to give us a sense of this kind of use is okay, this kind of use would not be at these levels of these materials. Okay, so a little cancer is okay. Well, no, not a no. little cancer. <laughs> Jane, I don't think he's saying that. Right. Well, would I mean, be, would, would not well, lead to. Right, that's what I'm asking. If, if once these are let loose or, or dug up, which they are, I mean, they're now loose from where they were, is this creating a hazard that was not there before? I mean, I realize all of these, the benzo stuff and all the other ones are part of co coal tar which is, was used to make, uh, you know, the stuff that they put on top of asphalt. It's just part of wh what you do. Every single uh, compound that I was looking at was part of that list. Um, and it's, you know, it is what it is. I'm just, have we created something that we didn't expect? Unexpected results, I guess, unexpected consequences. Well, I, I, yeah, and I don't, I don't see these as unexpected. Okay. Um, I mean, we build houses, we build schools, we build campuses. We build dormitories. We build all sorts of things, new highways, um, and and we know that we're we're disturbing the ground. And there are things in the ground that may or may not be um, harmful at some level of concentration. Okay. But we so, continue. But we continue to do it, and we have public health standards uh, and and techniques. And I think I'll can I that. can I help Steve out a little bit and mm -hmm. uh, introduce. Paul Morano, who, uh, who could probably add some more context to the standard that uh, Steve has been comparing these soil samples to and what the uh, results that we have found. Uh, I know that Steve only did eight samples, which was 16 total, but we also did 28 of our own before, you know, when we started this project in 2014. So we do have some data here that you know, we feel comfortable that we're not, you know, um, putting anyone in, in, in jeopardy based on the guidelines that we're following. Right. Well, so, to that point, and before, you, before Steve's dismissed, uh, uh, there is one. I don't want him dismissed. I want him well, to just there, help out right. a little there's, bit here. There, there's yeah. a, there's just one sort of hypothetical question then. I mean, if, if you're a worker at R8, R8, the, the lead finding is 972 parts per million. Standard is 500 federal guidelines for kids playing with soil is 400. California standard is 80 parts per million. Um, again, 972 parts per million. Uh, would, you, would you recommend that a, that, that a construction worker working at R8 wear a rebreather? I can't speak to that. Why don't we hear from Paul, get some context from, from as well. Steve, don't go far. We're going to no, catch you right here. Great, great. Thank you. Just introduce yourself to us. And uh, yeah, my name is Paul Morano. I'm a senior project consultant with Advanced Geoservices. I've been, uh, uh, I have a professional engineering license in nine states, and I've been practicing in the geosciences for over 40 years uh, as a consultant. Um, when you're discussing, um, let's say, standards, all right, there are a number of different standards now. Uh, when, I'm sorry, Steve, what's it? Uh, when Steve's study, when he's talking about, they compared it to uh, the statewide, speak a little closer, to the excuse me, they compared them to the statewide health standards, which are part of the Act II program. This is the program that the state sets up for voluntary cleanups of environmentally impacted sites, okay? okay? 
what we did, and, and again, I will tell you that the, the numbers that are listed there as uh, residential direct contact um, have a code of, if you look on the table that the DEP publishes, they have a code of G there, which means ingestion. All right, so what they're saying is that if you eat more than this amount, then you have a slightly elevated risk of cancer. All right, um, it's, it's the inhalation number is a lot higher. So if you disturb some of this material there, um, first of all, that, you know, as long as you don't eat it, at, at the levels we've seen. Wait, so, pardon me, you just mentioned inhalation versus ingestion, which is worse? Pardon me? Which is worse, ingesting it or inhaling it? Worse in what way? We're speaking of lead here, for example, which is worse, eating lead or inhaling it? Well, eating is usually a, uh, you know, a much more direct uh, avenue uh, is it? of exposure, but, uh, you know, I don't know specifically what the values are for inhalation, but normally they're higher. Right. If and I, the other thing if is I were able to, If I were to quote an expert saying that inhalation is far worse than ingestion, would you be surprised? Pardon me? If I were able to quote an expert who says that inhalation is far worse than ingestion, would you be surprised? Well, no, I wouldn't because it depends on what you're looking at. But the other thing that I will say is that as part of the normal construction procedure, you keep the dust down and you water where you have to. If you keep, lead is, is one of, and most of the metals are the type of things that attach to the soil particles, okay? They're not free floating. So that as long as you, um, you know, maintain dust control, then there's no chance or, extremely limited chance of inhalation of any material. The other thing I think that, that you know, uh, that I wanted to point out is, is you're looking at numbers here on the table mm -hmm. and you're talking about four parts per million or two parts per million or whatever. And yes, there are, you know, part per million is a very small amount. To kind of give you an idea, if you look at the size of this room, uh, something the size of a golf ball would be one part per million in this volume, okay? And so when you're talking about a very large site, um, or actually when you're talking about the small amount of material that is used to do the analysis, okay, and you're talking about four parts per million in that small amount, you're talking almost on the molecular level. Okay, I, I hope I've clarified some of that point, I mean, Again, uh, federal standards are 400 parts per million for kids playing in soil. California standards are 80. The, the finding at R8, and who knows where else, is 972. That's an exceedance of, in one case, in, by one standard, at least two, and in another case, at something greater than 10. We are working toward the standards that are established by the state that we work in. And the industry standard in Pennsylvania is set by the Pennsylvania DEP. And their standard for lead, I believe, for direct contact is 500. Um, whether California does something different, that's up to California. But in the state of Pennsylvania, the DEP has established the standards. And when you say direct contact, what does that involve? Direct contact means exactly what it says, that you have to touch the soil. Um, it's usually meant it touches you. when you talk about the Act II standards and you're talking about residential, it's usually modeled for, let's say, children playing in the yard who might dig up the dirt and God knows get it in their mouth or whatever. Okay, that's what direct contact means. If you have something covering that particular spot, whether it's a building or whether it's uh, a parking lot or whether it's six feet of soil, okay, you've essentially capped it and there's no avenue for someone to get in direct contact with that material. Okay, so we really have three, notwithstanding all the pieces that had some measurement of some sort or another, they, except for three items, three or four items, they all fell far short of the standards. Yes. And, and I mean, is that typical that you would find that in naturally occurring soils even? Well, it, it depends on the site, of course. Of course. Um, 
It's not surprising that you right. would find something it's, of something. No, it's not surprising that you'll find something. So, um, so there's many, many items that were not found, not, not discovered, some that were for, to some minor degrees that were, that were beyond, well below the standards. And we're, we're, we're left with three or four here that, are, that in certain spots have been detected to be above the standards. So that's kind of the situation we're in at the moment, right? That is correct. And there are ways to evaluate those specific outliers, okay. uh, which I, I don't know whether to go into it now or I, I'll wait till I speak later, I guess. Um, it's a good time right now. Pardon me? It's a good time right now. Okay. Um, when we did our study, we were looking at uh, clean fill standards. All right, now the state of Pennsylvania, DEP, has established these standards for any soils that might be leaving your site as part of the construction. Um, they're meant to be to safeguard the, the public health. And if a material is considered clean fill, if it meets the standards, then it's considered innocuous. And you can take it and you can put it you know, in a playground, or you can put it in the, the play yard of a preschool, or you can put it wherever you want because it's, the soil is considered clean fill. Now, within the DEP, um, there, are, there are procedures, well, the sampling procedures for clean fill, which is what we followed, are laid out by the DEP. They tell you how many samples you need to take for, uh, you know, for a given uh, amount of soil you're going to excavate. Um, and then what you do, of course, is you, you try and get them at different depths so that you can get a vertical profile as well as an aerial profile of what's going on. We did that. Mary Lou mentioned 28 locations uh, or 28 samples. Actually, we did 28 uh, borings. We took a total of 45 samples plus five duplicate samples. And of those, uh, only one, we also had one that had, that was above the standards for benzopyrene and also for lead. All right, now the DEP recognizes the fact that sometimes you'll have a site and you just have an anomaly like that. And rather than condemn the entire site for that one anomaly, they give you a statistical method to evaluate whether the average concentration of the entire soil mass is above the, the limit or not. And uh, this particular statistical method is actually on the DEP's website. You can download it and you can use that. And what it is is that you have to show that there's a, what they call a 95% confidence limit or 95% <coughs> probability that your average concentration for that uh, particular compound over the site is below the, uh, the DEP standard. And we use that, uh, that particular analysis to show that, we originally used it to show that for the, the, the two samples we had that were above, um, that the 95% upper confidence limit was achieved and that the DEP then considers that not a problem. When, um, when RETU did their study and they had those two hits, we went back and we looked at those two in addition to the samples we had. So there was a total of, um, between the two of us, there's a total of 61 samples that were taken. Um, only two of those show uh, problems, and uh, which is like 3%. Uh, and when we did the statistical analysis that the DEP lays out for that, um, we found that the, the mean, uh, the arithmetic mean is below the standard. So again, the DEP, by their definition, would consider this clean fill. And what depths were the other ones taken then? Uh, the, the original ones prior to all this testing, when you did your, for your clean fill, what uh, depth was that taken at? What, we took them at various depths. Various depths, depths? Okay. yes. All right, so it was I mean, very good. The intent was to model the material that was going to be excavated Got from it. the basement. So we did it at different depths and different areas. So you did deep and you went, did shallow yeah. and in between. Yes. Got it. So this modeling that you're talking about to get your confidence level, is that some sense of a matter of dilution? Like to say that if I found one spot that was above it, I could average it out amongst all the spots that I took and see where that was? Yes, it's a statistical method to do that. Um, uh, 
but it's a little bit more than just taking an average. It's, um, and, and I'll have to apologize because I'm not a, an analyst um, to know all the sp statistics that go into it, but it's a way of taking an average and showing that your probability of achieving that is 95% or greater, or 95% rather, I'm sorry. So you're, you're, you're what well, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the beryllium, which was, which was minimal, noted fiber two, you found similar or even less? Well, we... And we didn't find beryllium. You didn't find it, that's no. right. No. All right. So, so we, let's for the moment just hold on and say, let's rule that one out for a minute to, to bear down on two, the two areas that we, that we really have some kind of hits. One is the lead and the other is the benzopyrene. Yes. Is, that, is there anything else or are those the two that we're talking that about? That. Okay, so that's, that's where really we're zeroing in on. If this was, now, you have a situation where you have some of it, you don't have all of it, we're gonna hear about how we average that out or how we analyze that, those statistics. But jump ahead for a moment, if you found that in concentration, what would be the recourse? What would be the resolution of having found this in there? Uh, what would you do with it? What would you, what, what would you, how would you mitigate this? If we found a, um what? Lead and benzopyrin, yes. Well, the first thing you do is, you know, when you set up your sampling program, you try and get a representative sampling of the entire soil mass. And so that's what we did. And when you, when you do that, and all of your samples, you know, 46 of your samples, or I'm sorry, 44 of your samples come out well below the limits, and one comes out above, then you look at that as an anomaly. Um, you know, if it were, and, and the, the first thing you would do is the, 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 excuse me, the statistical analysis to see whether it is an issue or not. If it were an issue, then you would go back and do some additional sampling to confirm the extent of it, but that was not necessary here. When you did your sampling, your borings, uh, you really spread it, you, you spread it out pretty much, averaged it out over the parking lot. We have you know, that, that would fill in some of these gaps that we, that we see here? Did you yeah, cover uh, the whole thing pretty much? Really? Or, how, or how much did you cover? These are just the samples that we took for housing, not for the Performing Arts Center. Right, or, just put on the table right there and then they'll zoom in. Or for West Lancaster the, Avenue. Yeah, so the main lot. Th this is just for main lot. Main lot, right. Do they know to do that? But we did this process for every project that we have done. Mm -hmm. okay. I think he's getting them to put it on. I'll just ask a quick question. But I look at every single solitary depth and spot, and in every single one, lead and arsenic were both, except for in two cases, were detected. There, there is a, a measurable amount of lead and arsenic. That's not a problem? At the concentrations they're at, no. Hmm. Or to the environment, or to leaching somewhere, or going somewhere now that they're dug up. Well, this, this is why the DEP sets these standards. They, they do a risk allocation for the different compounds and look at the exposure pathways and, and the concentrations. And the DEP in their risk analysis has determined that, for example, if you have four parts per million of arsenic, that is not considered a problem. Interesting. Okay. So, to, just, so just to be clear, the, the, the samples that we're looking at here are core samples or just sort of shovelfuls taken from fill that is already dug up? The, the uh, green sample, the green locations are the test borings done by uh, Advancio, my company, Advancio Services, um, and the, the red locations are the locations done by RITU. And you can see the outline of the, the buildings um, on, uh, you know, on the main lot. So essentially you did the dots that are, with, are within the building uh, envelopes and RITU did the ones that were outside of it? Yes. Okay. Because red and green don't show up here. So, in that sense, you did have, we, I mean, you did have uh, sampling that's happened represented throughout the entire parking lot. 
especially the area that has been dug up now. Yes, right. Okay. Steve, let me ask you a question. I know you were absent for some of this here, but you're familiar with these items here. Uh, how do you process all this from a township level? Um, how do you put that in perspective uh, from, your, from your point of view? Uh, so w what I look at is, you know, from, from my area of knowledge, it's soils for cuts, fills, things like that. So this gentleman and the geoscientists at Ratu, this is their area of expertise. And I think I, I look at things a few ways. We have uh, the Vilner report that did, uh, was done, those borings that were done, that the site passed for clean fill. And again, so we, we have to go by a standard, right? We can talk about various things, but good, bad, or indifferent, or if we agree or don't like or like the standard, you need a standard to be able to make some kind of a determination. So based on the, on the original borings that Bill Nova did, that site met the requirements for clean fill, which meant that that soil could be used on any project, you know, another building project, a ball field, wh whatever you wish. Uh, what Steve Gabriel came up with, and I, and I guess I will have to ask him, but I think here's the big question, there's the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Everybody wants to know, is the site safe? And I know that's a loaded question because again, to say, oh, is it safe? What are the standards? What makes it safe? Are, are, you know, are we ingesting the soil? Are we, uh, are we breathing it? So that's the question we, I guess everybody wants to hear. And you know, I, I have to defer to Steve for him to tell us if based on the standards he used or the standards uh, Mr. Morano used, is the site safe? Because that's what the commissioners hired Ritu for, was to tell us, is, is everything copacetic? Can we move forward as, can they move forward and everybody's good? Uh, we do have the one report that says from a fill standpoint, it is safe. You can use that fill anywhere you want for any kind of project. Uh, so I, I'm gonna defer to Steve and or Mr. Morano to a point to tell us, is the site safe? That's, that's the big question, that's what everybody wants to know. So if I, I am actually on that site pretty regularly and I am out of the truck and I'm walking around you know, so, do, you know, I, sure, I want to know if it's safe. Uh, I think, and, and all the neighbors do. Anybody, and, and nobody's, is, nobody's saying by any means that Villanova would ever do anything purposely that would uh, endanger the, the many students going to live there. I, I don't think that is out there. I want to make sure that's understood. We're just looking at something different based on what the commissioners asked us to do. Well, let me say this. Um, as part of our study, you, you have a due diligence report that we did. And uh, let me clear up some confusion. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, report. if I may. Um, I'm sorry to jump in, but um, let me just give my two cents real quick. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize for this, but I mean, we, we we're not experts at this, and I know both of you gentlemen that come in here, I mean, we're talking the sciences, and I know we talked about what levels are in the ground, what they can be, if they're ingestible, or if they're friable, or if they're inhalable, or that. I mean, we all know that, depending on how this is prepared, how it's taken out, um, my father died from mesothelioma, and how mm -hmm. that came out, you know, of how that's presented, how that came out, so there's different scenarios of how this is. We know we're talking about the soils, what's in there and how that comes out. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think either of you gentlemen are experts that can actually tell us one way here, take no offense to this. But I think Steve's question of what he said, we're just looking for a yes or no answer. Is the site safe for the use that they have that they're putting forward? I mean, I think that's all we're asking for. Is it or isn't it? With, I mean, it's that simple. Is it or isn't it? I, unless I'm looking at anything wrong from you, I mean, I think that's all the township's looking for. Is it safe? Yes or no? Is the site safe and what's being done on the site? Are there going to be impacts downstream, the water coming off there? Is there going to be impacts? And it should be no, there isn't, or yes. It's, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at it too simple, but is the site safe for what the uses there have? Yes, it's safe based on that water running off there because the stream that goes down, which Ratu's doing the study on, are there any concerns we should have based on what we see in these results? No. 
I, I don't know. I think that's all we're looking. That's all we're looking for. That's, uh, if, that, that was my question. I, I, we I mean, it's to the yes experts. or no. I mean, I it's really that. Please. All right. Um, as part of our due diligence study, we did what we did all the procedures that you would normally do. Maybe for, maybe I'm. Uh, is it yes or no? I mean, that's. I, I know you're well, trying I, to get. I, but I need to explain to you why I'm going to tell you yes, it's safe. Okay. Okay. Um, we did, as, as part of the due diligence study, we did uh, what is essentially a phase one ESA, which is a historical research of the property and the surrounding areas. We looked at aerial photos. We looked at uh, historic aerial photos. We looked at historic topo maps. We looked at Sanborn maps. We interviewed local officials. Uh, we um, uh, we uh, reviewed an environmental database of environmental uh, impacts or events that have happened within a you know, given area around the site, and, uh, and we did a site reconnaissance, and all those things are part of a normal phase one ESA. In this particular case, it was just called a due diligence, but arose by any other name. Uh, what that showed was that there were no environmental impacts on that site or in the surrounding areas that impacted this site. The, uh, the particular main lot area was a field uh, from the first aerial photo we saw, which was 1938, and then somewhere in the mid-50s, it was paved and used as a parking lot. It's never been used for anything else. Um, in addition to that, we took all these samples, uh, we took a representative number of samples throughout the, the site to look at the soil mass to see what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of issues we might have. And what we found is that uh, the soils were benign. There were two that were above the standards, yes. But when you go through the DEP procedures for evaluating that, they are considered acceptable. And so based on all that, and even, and having said that, looking at Ratu's samples and again, combining them with ours and going through this same statistical analysis, you come up with the fact that the DEP considers this site benign. So based on that information, my answer to you, sir, in my opinion, is that yes, this site is safe. My question too, so. Great, good, thank you, thank you. Steve, why don't you come back up again for a sec. Let's, let's ask you the same question. For the intended use of the site, yes. Yeah, our, our guys did not compile these findings and come to me and say, we've got a problem. There's an issue here. Villanova's got some things they got to deal with. Um, they, you know, they, they indicated that this is a, a, these were rare occurrences uh, in the overall scheme of everything that was sampled. Then when you look at surrounding nearby sampling locations and find none detected, um, that isolated those findings even more. Uh, then when you look at the intended use uh, at those locations, uh, covered with either perhaps building or in a very isolated location or covered with concrete walkway, yes, safe for the intended use. And, and in terms of impacts to, to Valley Run or to groundwater, uh, ultimately our sampling is, 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 is intended to show some time uh, trends over time um, and what, if any, impacts there are. Okay. And, and then also to Steve, if I may, Mr. Chairman, is this is an ongoing process that you'll be actually monitoring as we go along then too? Yes, we've, we've done it. We did it in May of this year. Um, oh, by Valley Run now, just Valley to be Run, clear. Yes, yeah. it's yeah. intended to be reanalyzed, re uh, you know, additional, additional round of sampling May of next year um, to begin a comparison of year to year um, conditions. Not only the Villanova work, but also the work that we're doing at Clement Home Park, because that was part of the, the study the field that you were looking at. Yeah, and yeah. you know, and, and and as and as Rick said, you know, the water is coming into Valley Run from a lot of places. Right. It's not just the main parking lot by any means, um, and so there, you know, what we may be finding in terms of our sampling and those results, uh, in terms of whether it's water quality or the macroinvertebrates. Um, you know, the, what is influencing those results, there are a lot of candidates out there, Group 30 uh, among them. Um, 
Okay, thank you for your, for your answers. Um, I, I have some questions or thoughts about the Valley Run study that you have, but I think we're gonna run out of time tonight to talk about them. Uh, Steve, need... Steve, just one question. When, when, you, when you use the word marginal then in your conclusions that, you're, that, that you find conditions at the site is here and there, not in total, but here and there as, quote, marginal, what exactly did you mean? I, I didn't want to discount the fact that there were a couple of locations where there were exceedances of the of the standards. Uh, I mean, it's but not, hey, it's all good on average. No, I think based on based on DEP standards, and then the 95 percentile calculation that that they also right employed, on average. If I had if I had 100 acres and on one corner I had a dioxin pond. On average, we'd be good to go. I don't know that you would be, but in, in since it's hypothetical, but given given the the, the finding at the R-2 location, you take a look at okay, what's happening below? Because that was a, that was a shallow depth. Right. What's happening below there? Nothing is happening <laughs> below there. What's happening nearby at R-3? Nothing, shallow or deep. It's starting to indicate that that's a very isolated finding. One further question. Did you test for co cobalt in your course? I don't know. Let's, let's look at the table. Do you know the answer? I don't know. You it find, doesn't look you, like you, it. You find none. It doesn't show up anywhere in your course at all. Nope. The reason that's interesting is because in the letter from Gannett Fleming, um, Based on their assessment of values, three contaminants were detected with concentrations that exceed the PADEP clean fill concentration limits, specifically cobalt, lead, and benzoapyrene. Although cobalt exceeded clean fill allowable concentrations in several sample locations, it's considered as background or native material by the U.S. Department of Interior. It's curious you didn't find any. I, we didn't sample for it. Oh. And that would be yeah. because okay. it's, I not, it's not part of the DEP. I don't think they well, tested for that. If that's you didn't fine. look for it, that was my question. Yeah. Because that's, that's what I said. Let me let me look at the table, and it's not here. So no, we didn't. They, we didn't we gave you specific it. charges of things to look for. We looked at yeah. DEP's PPL list. Yes. Um, and VOCs and SVOCs. Okay. And l let me just to be clear, the, the idea that uh, you're saying that overall this is safe, and if you have hot pockets, I'll call it a hot pocket of lead or benzopyrene, that one of the things that you would do with this is cap it. Is that correct? Phil, I'm, I'm sorry, to, but I think hot pocket is an inflammatory phrase. All right. So you have an well, area. A lead, a lead concentration you double a, what's you know, the federal I, limit I, is a kind of an elevated, right, well, a, a, elevated I'm, I'm, occurrence. I'm okay with that. I'm just yeah. going to say you have, a, you have an area, a core sample that was above the average or above the standard. Let's use that. And if you had that, one of the, one of the things that you would do with it is to cap it and just control it but not letting it leak out. As long as you knew where it was. And. You've identified those three areas. I think they were R2, R6, and R8. And those locations match up to a walkway, a driveway, and a building corner, right. which would be consistent with all of that. So even if that was the case, and, and you were asked to, to address it, would those be considered ways that you would address it? You, you eliminate the exposure path. Let's, let's what you would do is eliminate the exposure pathway by capping it either with soil or with a building or with uh, asphalt parking lot so that uh, there can be no exposure to people on the surface. We've kind of come to the end of our established time for this particular meeting. I know we didn't get to the Valley Run um, answer on that. Um, and I would like to suggest that we did, we had talked about um, coming up with a bi monthly meeting, but I'm going to I'm going to wonder if Phil, do you want to take public comment? I will, but a minute, but I just want to get this out there, and that is to say, I would like to see if we can consider doing something sooner rather than later. So uh, we have the freedom of choice to decide any night we want, because Bob, we have a second venue, don't we, to, to, to do to do televising. <laughs> So miracle of miracles, we have a second venue, so we can have it at the second venue in case this room is being used. So uh, 
is it is it possible to come up with a night tonight, or is that something that we need to go ahead with to see if we can come up with another night to continue our discussion on this other items? Our normal meeting would be a Thursday, which would be uh, July 6th, so I don't know if people are away that time or not. First Thursday of the month. You good? We are not here. Steve's, Steve's not here. All right. Let's move ourselves to the uh, next Thursday, the 13th. You're not, you're not here. All right. How about, uh, well, on the 20th, this, you're not here either because that's a zoning hearing board meeting. Can we go to a different night? How about, I'm sorry? Of July? 6th of July, somebody had a problem. I'm Steve's not, Steve's not. On the Valley Run. And any other spillover we got, but Valley Run, yeah. Okay. Uh, Absolutely. And honest, and honestly, the, the the interpretation of the stream report is very different than that of the soils report, right? I think it's something that everybody can wrap their arms around. Um, it's, it's very different in that they're not going to DEP standards. I mean, not that they're not looking, you, you see the tables and charts, which tells you the level of impairment of the stream. So it's something I think everybody can understand very easily, especially with a little explanation by Red 2. I don't think that's a big issue. I would like, I wish Sarah, Pil I wish Sarah Pilling was here because it was noted that the wetlands at Clem McCrone Park do help that stretch of stream. So, and I know she was involved as a volunteer there. So, just so for folks to know in, in TV land, that was actually the best part of the stream is where it went by the park where, where our construction is taking place. So, go ahead and throw that out there. That'll be fine. If you think it's great, that'll be good. Steve, can you ask Annika to be here? Yes, sir. Six, sixth it is on uh, July, and we'll either have it here or we'll have it at our second venue. All right? Great. Okay, I just want to make sure that got settled. Uh, on that score. So with that, let me ask for uh, public comment. Brief, that we're bumping up against, but take the time that you need. Okay, Roberta Winters, I just have a few questions and I would hope I might get answers. Is that all right, if I could ask them? And I was gonna ask if you and your sampling did any of the, asbest the as asbestos testing that was done by Ritu? Did you do any testing for asbestos as Ratu had done? No. Had you looked at their asbestos findings and or the tests that they used to see if they were appropriate for doing the asbestos testing? Uh, Roberta, can I answer that question? Yes. He did not. Okay. So we did not have Paul look at uh, those samples because we had already done them previously. Okay, thank you. So I would also suggest that I think it's somewhat reassuring that we've heard they were safe for clean fill in some cases, but they still, in areas, as everyone noted, that they do exceed the residential standards that I think are significant for many people who would live there or live near there. I am concerned that, in fact, the instances of the benzopyrene and also of the lead might indicate that that area, even though not shown in photographs or previous uses, might have some surprises that we don't know about. And that's always a question that always one would ask, is there, is there a surprise? And I think that um, the fact they are, there are separate standards are for a reason, and residential standards is where students are living and where we will be walking and where we will be nearby. So I think my concern is basically, I think in some instances there are spaces that are marginal and probably beyond marginal to being above standards. And I would really, given that we are basically novices in this field, I would feel much more reassured if the Board of Health had had a look at these and talked about them last night and also the Environmental Advisory Council because I think they have 
the expertise that those of us who are lay people do not have. So I would really appreciate, in terms of the peace of mind of those of us who live in the area and for Villanova and their future students, if perhaps we might have a review and some kind of statement from each of those boards concurring with what is probably a consensus among some of the people who are here. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, good evening, Tony Welcome. Bailey, uh, Conestoga Village. Um, a number of times the uh, DEP standard was mentioned. So I am wondering, uh, with the DEP standard, w did they take into consideration this particular area, which is so close to 476, emitting emissions all day long, and Route 30? And how does that meld in with um, people possibly, you know, inhaling this and lead being, you know, lead exposure? Just what does that mean by the DEP standard and this particular area? And how would all of this melded together impact the residents and, of course, the Villanova community? You want to answer? You don't have to. Okay, I'm not even sure what the question was. Okay. If you want to restate it, feel free. As I said, um, DEP standard uh, was mentioned many times. So I'm wondering, uh, in reference to the DEP standard, how that standard takes into account the area in which we live in being so close to 476, 30, and all the admissions every, you know, it being admitted every day. How does that, uh, how is that standard impacted by the levels of lead or whatever else that you found? If I can restate it, is there any interaction between the standards as set for the state and the fact that we live close to major highways, 476 and Route 30, does that have any impact or interaction at all? If you answer, just come on up. Thank you, Tony. The, standard, the standards that we were talking about are for the soils. Uh, the fact that there are major roadways close by I mean, maybe that has something to do with air emissions, but um, the soils, and especially now, most of them were covered before we excavated them. So, you know, if you're asking me were they impacted by the, the traffic or the adjacent roadways, my answer would be no. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, I'll ask if there's any new business, any new old business. Right. Other than that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn until our next meeting. So moved. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.